In July 2023, Edinburgh Pensioners for Independence Group invited Sarah Sawyers of Salvo to talk to them about Salvo. What is Salvo? What, what are its aims? How is it going to achieve them? Sarah talks for about 20 minutes. Uh, she gives a historical context of when and how the Treaty of Union came about and refers to the various other pieces of legislation from around that time, including, of course, the Scottish Claim of Right of 1689, but also with reference to the English Bill of Rights, also of 1689. And as Sarah says, if we are trying to get a divorce from the Union, we need to properly understand what kind of marriage we actually entered into in 1707. And we also need to understand the role of the monarch in Scotland and in England, because they are very different kinds of monarchies. Salvo contends that it's necessary to clarify just what Scotland's constitutional position is. A colony, an annexed territory, a voluntary partner in a political union, and Salvo's own view is that far from entering into a voluntary political union, Scotland was in fact annexed by England. Are these claims being overstated, especially in the face of current Westminster intransigence to discuss a second referendum? Perhaps they are. Does Salvo's take on things understate the extent to which Scots pragmatism has assented and made the most of the Union since 1707? Possibly it does. Does Salvo have a route to take their claims forward? They say they do, and Sarah goes into some of that in, in the discussion. Certainly there is a lot of debate among constitutional specialists on this subject of Scotland's constitutional position. But most importantly, is this something worth getting our heads around? And definitely it is. We hope you enjoy the discussion. Our thanks to Edinburgh Pensioners for Indy for access to the recording. We've done our best to boost the quality. It is sometimes hard to hear the questions in the latter half of the meeting. A year ago, um, on the, well, just over a year ago, on the 2nd of July 2022, Salvo launched in Falkirk. We had 200 members at the time. We have 6,000 more than that now and hubs starting out across Scotland and the aim was to, to change the conversation about Scottish self-determination um, because you know, I, I, you know I'm a granny, I'm a pensioner for Hindi myself and I first joined the SNP little years ago you know, um, when I was in my 20s and the conversation, the, the the movement, the campaign had always been, and, and I had really just accepted that along with everybody else, about a legal route out of a union that wasn't working for Scotland. It's abusive. We've got, you know, we all know that. Completely abusive, unfair. And, it, you know, seen, we saw it in terms of really, you know, we're in a bad marriage, a union, we need a divorce. So the first step, really, for, for me in, in changing that perception was the realisation that, in fact, there was what I called a prenup that was a condition to the union and to the treaty. And this is a, this is a legally, constitutionally binding condition that both parliaments were required to ratify a 1706 Scottish Act which uh, upheld various religious provisions for Scotland. But the one name at act in that was the Claim of Right. And with a bit of digging, you discover that nobody in Scotland at that time saw the Claim of Right as a purely religious thing at all. They saw it as a constitutional protection. It was actually protected under pain of high treason. You weren't allowed... Uh, when the William the Psycho Orange uh, it, it told Scotland he was going to be king or else, um, you saw that document, that claim of right, produced 
he, while he was saying, by the way, my, my army's at your border and fleet's on the, on the fourth, um, being produced to restrain his power, to, ins- to make sure that what had applied in Scotland in terms of the, the sovereignty of the people and the rights and civil liberties of the people and the religious rights would remain in place. Now, he gave, he'd actually, what they did, the Convention of the States was very clever. Um, he gave them the text. It was written by, I can never remember the guy's name, the, uh, the, you know, one of these Taliban Puritans that wrote the speech for... He also gave the text to the English Bill of Rights. But the Scots were clever, they took it, and they turned it around. And instead of saying what he'd asked them to, that they were deposing James because he was a papist, they changed the words that being a papist, he had violated, invaded the fundamental constitution of Scotland and failed to take the legally required oath of accession, the Scottish, what they call the Scottish coronation oath, but it's actually accession. So that you look at it, look at it again, you can see what they did. And it took a while to get this together and William was getting really impatient, but they banked on the fact that he'd be so desperate to be named as King of Scots, along with his, the real uh, candidate Mary, that he'd just sign it, he'd agree. And he did. He did. Then he tried to change it. And he got his faction to try and change it. And it was when he tried to, re- to limit the right of the Scottish people to petition, which also meant protest back then, that he was told, you can't do that. You've signed the claim of right as a condition of monarchy in Scotland. And so then he tried to get the claim of right changed. And twice, two different ways. And the response of the Scots, because the Scots Parliament at that time had actually been the Convention of the Estates, they, uh, they, they, they moved over to become the Parliament. Their response was to make it, was to pass an act, making it a treason to attempt to subvert or undermine in any way the claim of right. And so William was stopped. Unfortunately, he didn't live to see that piece of legislation restricting him because he fell off his horse and was killed. And if I'd been an investigative journalist in those days, I'd have said, aye, that's assassination, and I'd have gone and looking to, to who knocked him off his horse. Um, he was not a popular chap. Um, so that, that was the standing. Now, what, we, what have we been told about the claim of right? Oh, it's all this sectarian nonsense. And yet, the Bill of Rights... Which it wasn't. I mean, you know, that's there. That's called statutory effect. And just like the Bill of Rights, which the Supreme Court of England, pretending to be the Supreme Court of the UK, because that's unconstitutional and against the treaty, that court upheld the English uh, principle of parliamentary sovereignty over Scotland last October, based on the Bill of Rights, 1689, which was not actually lawfully passed, unlike Scotland's claim of right, was certainly not ratified as a condition of the Treaty of the Union, but that was what was upheld, and it's more sectarian than the claim of right. So all those effects have passed away. Nobody bothers about them for the Bill of Rights, this mother of parliaments. But they pretended that our claim of right is just this awful old sectarian nonsense. It absolutely isn't. And I'll go into what it guarantees Scotland... Um, in a wee bit. But that was clearly, that upheld, the claim of right upholds the sovereignty of the people over their government. It's the right of the Scottish people to sack a king and a parliament, which they did, and to tell them off and to tell them this is because you violated our fundamental constitution. But you'll be told we don't have a constitution. As we've gone into this, and this has been the deepest dive in terms of research and and work of my life, what we've actually, what has come to light is extraordinary. And it really does, and it really must, change the conversation about Scottish self-determination. So some of you may have heard this, um, but for those who haven't, this is likely to be a, a bombshell. What if I told you that the United Kingdom of Great Britain is a con, a fiction? It does not exist. It does not exist in fact, and it does not exist in law. And I'll prove that to you in a minute, but just consider that for a second. 
we've been trying to get out of something that doesn't exist. We've been trying to get a divorce from a marriage that never happened. Scotland was annexed. There is no union. Now, doesn't that change? Think about that for a minute. That bombshell. Think about how we've worked and fought and campaigned and stood all that we and leafleted and to try to arrange an amicable legal divorce from a, a marriage that doesn't work and it never existed. There is none. So all this time, without our knowing it, the fiction that was that was put forward by the English state, the pretense that Scotland was in a union, that something called the United Kingdom had come into existence, that uh, we had no, you know, and, and we had to find some way out of it, has had us going round and round in circles, because that's a dead end. That's a cul-de-sac that leads back into itself, around and around and around. We're never going to get out of a union that doesn't exist. Anybody in continental Europe, and a lot of people in the States, could tell you that where a new state comes into existence, and we're all agreed that's what the English state pretends happened, a new state came into existence called the United Kingdom of Great Britain. That's what the international community has been told and believes <laughs> for the time being. Any such state is predicated on something called a constitutional settlement. I'm, I've got awfully paranoid in my old age since doing all of this research. But I, truthfully, I do not believe it is coincidence that we do not have anything remotely resembling the kind of civics that are taught routinely in Canada and America and, and, the Europe, and, and in Europe. Of course, it's not a, of course it's not a coincidence. But who here knows what a constitutional settlement is? It's the basis of any agreement, whether it's internal, between the government and the people, the monarch, the government and the people, or in the case of an international treaty creating a new state, it is the settlement between the two nations that create that treaty. Is that fairly straightforward? Mm -hmm. Right. What's the constitutional settlement of this new state of the UK? The English constitution. Thank you. The constitutional settlement, in fact, are the terms and limits of the Treaty of Union. That's, the con that's what it's supposed to be. The constitutional settlement is, is what that newly created state depended on in terms of the agreement. England just immediately turned around and went, well, you know, um, now that Westminster is the, uh, is the parliament and Westminster is sovereign, wait, uh, we can make it mean whatever we want. And it'll be the article now to the union that governs it. That's the constitutional settlement. We can change that any way we like. You know, that is, that is something that Mark Elliott, who is head of the law faculty at Cambridge, called political kryptonite when he was talking about it in terms of, of, of Brexit and the, uh, the internal market bill and, 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 and how the UK was going to ignore international law. He said, that's political kryptonite. It's nonsense. This, it's exceptionalism. They can't say the law will mean whatever we want because we're sovereign. Not in an international treaty. He said, this is the sort of thing that dissolves on contact with um, legal reality once it's exposed internationally. So what they've done is they've pretended that there is no constitutional settlement. And, as you said, instead, what we have as the constitution... So let's have a look. This is your proof that the UK doesn't exist. If there were a new state, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, then that state would, would have, at, at the very least, it has a constitutional settlement in which preserves what is agreed in both countries, or it has its own constitution. What do we see, in fact? We see the constitution beginning with Magna Carta and carrying on through the Petition of Right. Oh, well, of course, it's got the claim of right. Nope. According to the, you know, the claim of right was so much more robust, so much more powerful, so much more empowering of the people of Scotland, re referencing as it did that, that constitution reaching right back, actually to Kenneth McAlpin, to the Code McAlpin. 
But certainly the declaration of the clergy and people, the declaration of our growth, provisions for, for uh, civil, civil rights, restriction of the power, the royal power, blah, 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 blah. But no, that's not there in the UK Constitution. Then we come up from there to the Bill of Rights, passed in 1689, when Scotland was still a completely sovereign, independent nation. Then we come to the Treaty of Union. It's very difficult to find the language in which to express what this English state strutting around naked under the Union Jack actually does. But what it has done, what it does is it says, well, we have to have the claim of right because it's a condition of the Union, but we won't let on that that's why it's what they call a core constitutional document. And we'll get Charles, we'll get the monarch to take an oath which acknowledges the religious provisions, which are now defunct, and nothing else. And we'll let people think that that's it. That was, it's Scotland's weird Presbyterian uh, tradition that we've got to uphold here, and it's one of these bits of archaic law that you just have to do. Nothing of the kind. Nothing of the kind. We will pretend that this isn't an international treaty. In fact, we'll come up with an amazing argument which goes all the way back to the Victorian Dicey, whereby what, what, what happened was that the treaty created a new state, and that meant that the two states that had signed the treaty ceased to exist, and that the new state that was created, now didn't, they didn't have any representatives, so it couldn't possibly be a treaty that was now the constitutional settlement. It had to become the acts passed by these two parliaments, and the Parliament of Scotland, of course, doesn't exist anymore. Hold it, guys. Neither parliament exists anymore. So if they were, if they were, at the moment of ratification, they annihilated themselves to create a new parliament, then the acts can't possibly be the things that govern the constitutional settlement of the UK. You've just written yourself out of existence. And that's how they tell you, as far as they were concerned, they wrote Scotland out of existence, but not the English parliament. But if there's a UK, that parliament is a new one. It is one in which the, you know, both of those cease to exist and the previous acts of that parliament, which the treaty says fall if, they're inco- if they are incompatible with the treaty, should have fallen. Now, the only condition that was ratified as a, as a condition of the Union was the claim of right, which makes the people sovereign. The Bill of Right wasn't. wasn't. There's a conflict here. Which one is supposed to take precedence? The ratified condition. Instead... The condition of a parliament that no longer exists has taken precedence. Add all of what so there's the political settlement, an English political settlement, an English constitution that had nothing to do with Scotland. So you have three legs of the, the constitutional stool. Constitution from Magna Carta to the Union, political settlement of England, not Scotland even though the treaty says whatever isn't compatible with the new union in either country has to go. And since the claim of right couldn't, it obviously had to be the, the Bill of Rights. And so, no. Why? Because the treaty was a, fee, a legal fig leaf, a cover for exactly what the English state planned all along, which was the annexation of Scotland. The United Kingdom has never come into existence. Last leg of that stool. In Scots law... And uh, this is specified and upheld again in the claim of right. I, I mentioned that James was not deposed because he was a Catholic. It might as well have said he came from Mars and he was green. And, well, and, 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 uh, and, and this man who came from Mars and was green violated the Constitution, didn't take the accession oath. The reasons for his being deposed were not that he was green and from Mars and not that he was a papist. That's what he was and this is what he did and this is why he's deposed. The law says that that any lawful monarch in Scotland must take the oath of accession in order to be lawful monarch in Scotland. Now, Anne, who had negotiated that treaty, brokered it, had taken that oath. And within that oath are the words that I will swear, I, I I can't think, I'm not good enough to get it off the top of my head here, but... The, the, the would-be monarch swears to protect, uphold, and never to transfer and, or undermine the rights, rents, and privileges of the Scottish Crown. 
Now, that was the oath she took in order to be Queen of Scots. Having taken that oath, she had, she had undertaken the limits of government, the constitutional monarchy in Scotland. So the authority by which she now operated as a queen and brokered the treaty meant that she legally could not touch the constitutional standing of the Scottish Crown. So the Scottish Crown remained in place. Massive constitutional problem for the United Kingdom. Did it get to work to, uh, to get agreement for a joint United Kingdom crown? No, it did not. What it did was put aside the Scottish crown. They, they've tried and tried to get rid of it, let me tell you, over the years. They haven't been able to. As a result, the institution of the Scottish crown remains in place, and Scotland is a sovereign territorial nation. The crown is the whole nation. A monarch in Scotland only represented the people. It, didn't, it wasn't like the English monarch. So when you go to the Petroleum Extraction Act and they talk about the oil and the petroleum being vested in His Majesty, that, that, that's Scottish oil and petroleum. It's not. That's an English crown. It cannot be vested in the monarch and right of an English crown when Scotland's a sovereign territorial nation and the crown still exists. It's just not possible, but that's what they did. They've taken everything they've taken in right of an English crown. There is no, there is an English crown imposed on Scotland and the House of Commons Library will tell you that. No monarch since Anne has taken the Scottish oath of accession because that would mean that there was a very clear division and, the, and England couldn't purloin and plunder Scotland because there would be the monarch taking the Scottish oath under which the crown is protected, upheld and never transferred and the English crown would be applying to England. Not one of them has taken it. Which means, my friends, for those Republicans among us, we don't have to get rid of the monarchy in Scotland. We can keep the crown, but we've no had a monarch since Anne. There is no legal monarch in Scotland. Charlie Boy cannot be King of Scots in right of an English crown. If he takes the Scottish accession oath, that's the end of the plunder of Scotland because it overturns all that vested in right of the crown stuff that is right there from 1935 coming all the way up. And it's a fraud and it's a crime and we're going to do something about it. But put that all together. English constitution from Magna Carta. English political, political settlement in violation of the condition of union. And the English crown, which nobody, there's... You look at a treaty, who had the competence to transfer these things, to change these things, to include these things? What was on the table? If I have a house in Edinburgh and it's next door to your house in Edinburgh, you can't sit down at the, with the real estate people and the, the lawyers and say, well, I'll throw in my neighbour's house as well while we're at it. Mm -hmm. Or turn around and say, well, I, 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 I bought your house, but I'm, I'm having that house as well. But that is precisely how the English state has behaved. Scotland never entered a union. The constitutional settlement has never been put in place. A joint constitution has never been developed. The crown, which is an extremely important institution in terms of um, resources and, 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 uh, and, and land use, has been subsumed under the English crown. They're doing everything they do in right of an English crown. which, And nobody had the gears and levers to, to transfer that. That was, the limits are as important in a treaty as the conditions to that treaty, and neither has been observed. Which means we don't have a union. We don't, Scotland is very clearly annexed. That is not a union. We don't have a united kingdom because the two crowns remain in fact and in law. You have to dig a bit for it, but they both remain. It's all hogwash that there's a single crown. Charlie Boy takes the English oath. That's what he took, by the way, the English oath, and adds Scotland to his dominions. Now, annexation is one thing, and we can show that. A union, a voluntary new state is entirely different. And that voluntary new United Kingdom never materialised, ever. 
no constitutional settlement, violation of the crown distinctions and, and the territory that never entered the Union. There's no such thing as the United Kingdom, it's just England. That's all that's there. And it's unlawful. It's an international crime. And we thought we were part of a union all this time. No, we weren't. We were annexed. And if you look back at the history of the independence movement and how it's been treated and how it's been responded to by various English prime ministers or English lackeys, you will see exactly that. You Suddenly the whole thing makes sense. We're an annexed territory. And if you want the last proof, go back to the Supreme Court <laughs> ruling last October. Scotland, well, it's a territory like Quebec. Right? They know. But now we know. And they're getting awfully worried because they've always known that if the international community found out what they were really doing in Scotland, they'd be in deep trouble. And that's why they're having conniptions about the idea of elected representatives going and speaking to international um, embassies and speaking at the UN. And, you know, they're, you're, all the things they're going to do to our elected representatives, they dare go and speak internationally. Fine. They can, they can pull out all the stops, but what they can't do is stop a liberation movement from doing that. So we will be doing that. In Scots law, what gave the English Parliament the right to declare a Supreme Court above Scots law? Because that also would Nothing. nullify Nothing. everything the, which was done last time. The, the, violation of the, the violations of the articles of, of, of the treaty, practically every single one of them, was violated. Um, the first thing that happened was that in that, that was a violation given. And remember, the, the limits of a treaty are as much part of it as the conditions. 1708, the English Parliament passed the English Treason Act in Scotland and imposed the English... That's where it by de facto imposed the English Crown in Scotland. Absolute violation. That was, you know, and at that point, Anne ceased to be legal monarch of Scotland. If, if, if they hadn't had troops everywhere, um, you know, that would have been enough. It, that, that ended it right there. But they've gone on doing it, you know, all the way down the centuries. And the, even Lord Cullen, Douglas Cullen, who is not my favourite person and was certainly Thatcher's lackey, even he told the College of Advocates, uh, the Faculty of Advocates, that he had very serious doubts about the legality of this Supreme Court because it violated both the Articles of Union and the Claim of Right. The rider to that, then, is... Can we take that further internationally in terms of um, petitions to, I don't know, the United Nations or whatever? I don't know. That about. They obviously don't recognise the European Court of Law. so that they Well, they do, it, actually, uh, but um, they do. And, and, not much. Uh, um, <laughs> we've, got, uh, we've got one thing going, we think, will be going to the European Court of Human Rights, but, but the whole plan of Salvo as the campaigning arm of liberation is to gain enough traction and validity, enough public support, that we can register with the United Nations as a liberation movement. That gets us recognition standing. That allows us to begin negotiations, talking, you know, talking, lobbying, explaining, blowing the cover of this so-called United <coughs> Kingdom, at a time, by the way, when probably most of the world would love to give the UK a bloody nose. <laughs> Absolutely love to. Ex-colonies, you know, what a joy to uh, teach them a lesson mm. uh, by, you know, helping to declare Scotland one of their colonies. But we're not, we're not, you can't go to the United Nations or the International Court of Justice and ask them to recognise Scotland as having the right to independence. That's nonsense. That's the, that's the mistake that's been making, be, made before. What you have to do is ask for a rule, an advisory ruling to clarify what is Scotland's real status. We can prove that the United Kingdom doesn't exist. We can prove that Scotland has been annexed, which is unlawful in international law, and that it has denied us, you know, that, that this has been a legal fiction, as it was in, with many of its colonial enterprises, by which they got a treaty and then did whatever the heck they as, as the cover for what they really wanted to do. 
and then set about creating, well, British India, which actually means English India, jolly old cricket, and the rest of it, and their civil servant. British India? British Wales, English Wales, and English Scotland. We all feel British, don't we? British was a word coined for Elizabeth I, um, uh, and, and she, you know, to to, to, uh, the, the, to describe the growing empire that she was so proud of. It, it's got nothing to do with the rest of, of, of anybody else in the world. It's a word for England. It always has been. But we're British Scotland, North Britain, North British Hotel. It's it, that's what they do. They turn you into an English, whatever you are, an English Ireland an English Scotland, an English Wales, an English India, an an, a jolly old English Kenya, a jolly old English... That's colonisation. And the, old th the rest of the world has no idea that they did it to us. But they're going to have. So what we need is clarification. If there's a union, where's the constitutional settlement? If they want to keep Scotland as part of their so-called union, then uh, why don't we ask them which it is? Are we a colony, an annexed territory, or are we a voluntary partner in a union with a constitutional settlement. If we are the, the colony, then we get listed for decolonisation, whether that's an advisory ruling or not. If we're not, well, then I'm afraid what you have to do right now is uh, you have to restore the property rights, rents and privileges of the Scottish Crown, which still exists, and uh, which you're taking under right of a foreign English Crown, um, unlawfully, fraudulently. That means we get a public body, not a government, not a parliament, a public body, to negotiate our oil, our gas, our renewables, and so on and so forth on our terms. A sovereign wealth fund. It's the crown is the people. It's the common good. It's actually listed as that. That's the constitutional settlement. You never had any right to the, what, what's there as part of the Scottish crown. And the claim of right makes it clear that the people have a right to direct democracy. If we can sack our government, we have to have a means to do it. So we can have a referendum on anything the heck we like, any time we like. That's the constitutional settlement, and if you're not going to honour it, then we'll just go ahead and get decolonised. And that's what we're planning to do with the liberation movement. That's exactly what we're planning to do. And that puts the ball in the court to answer this question. Which one is Scotland, and what are you going to do about it? So it doesn't. It wouldn't give us independence right away. No, I understand. But it would give us all the mechanisms and levers of independence, and I'd quite enjoy watching the English <laughs> state squirming as we did all that. Absolutely. And Sarah, just there's one term which I occasionally use, which is even worse than British. It's called uckish. UKish. Uckish. Oh. <laughs> Well, that's a fiction. The UK is as real as the unicorn. Yes. There you go. Sarah, just comment on the idea that um, this all happened a long time ago, and we, we are where we are now. Yes. <laughs> we are where we are now. Yes. Yeah. It's just a simple concept of international law when you know, the Treaty of Union happened. Well, much like the colony of India, which is now looking for former reparations, Ireland. I mean, that all happened so long ago. You know, why bother? I mean, they've, they've had, they've squatted in your house. They've uh, murdered your family. They've been stealing from your bank account for so long now that actually they are the proper residents. And they, I mean, this is so, they've been there for so long. These are the, these are the rightful owners and residents now. And, you know, and, and, and they have the right to do whatever they want. If you want to, 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 to share, share that house with them, then you have to put up with being raped and robbed and murdered and, and starved and whatever. It's like, it's like, it's all ancient history now. Uh-huh. We had a coronation and a declaration of Scotland as part of England's domains. Very recently, we have oil and gas flowing to the UK Treasury in right of an English crown, right now. That is not ancient history, and it's a fraud, it's a crime. Ian? Uh, I'll just get uh, we've been putting up, you know, the rest of the world will regard us as having put up with a situation for 300 years. How do we, I mean, I know there have been little <coughs> risings every now and again, but, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, I totally agree with your analysis of what has happened. I mean, I have no problem with that. 
But how are we going to convince international authorities, the UN, the courts, international courts, to actually that this is a pressing matter that needs to be dealt with? It's, there's a lot of work to be done, and we're doing as much of it you know, now as we can. Um, but it isn't actually difficult, because if you think of how long it held... England held on to India, how long it and how it's holding on to its Commonwealth territories today. You might think the empire is over, believe me, it is not. And there is a massive resentment um, growing across those so called Commonwealth countries today. I mean, really, there's real. I was talking to Craig Murray about this a couple of weeks ago, and he was remarking that up until about 20, 20 years ago, um, you would, we would have stood no chance with this argument. And the reason we would have stood no chance is because one of the things that happens under the, the colonising process is that the colonised begin to aspire to belong to the colonizers' club. So that you find in all these African countries and, East, and, and, uh, you know, and, and in Asia and in India, you find this... this uh, collaborative elite, this this minority, who who are and and that is because the co- colonizer puts uh, it, it it puts local um, uh, indigenous people in places of power that will cooperate with them and will administer on their behalf, and then a class, an administrative colonial class, develops. And if you've read Alf Baird or you listen to Alf, you know he describes them very very well. That cl- colonial class then becomes the ruling class in that country. And then other people, those below down who are held up, aspire to that. Now, so they want to go to English universities. They wish to speak with an English public accent. They want to be, belong to the club. They, you know, and that has happened, that happened all across the colonised world. To be a Brit, to be an Englishman, an, an Indian Englishman, an African Englishman, a Malaysian Englishman, and so on and so forth, was... Um, you know, absolutely the, the, the epitome. That was the aspiration. And those people, the ones who were at, in the UN from all those nations, came from the aspirant colonial administ- administration and felt themselves to be British. That's what was wrong with the UN. That's why it was never going to work until the sense of identity within these nations began to reassert itself. The one we are trying so hard now to, to, to revive in Scotland, for people to know what it means to be a Scot. What do we all have in common? What is that identity? Why is it so important that we don't lose it and become an, an English Scotland? That same thing, it took a long time in all these colonised countries, you know, it took at least 10, 10, 20 years for this to change, but it has changed now. And you will, the rhetoric now coming out of these former uh, colonies is ve- and, the, and these Commonwealth countries is very, very different. Once we lay this out, this is so familiar. Our story is so familiar. The massacres, the, the behead, public hangings and beheadings, the, the, you know, the, the, the absolute um, disregard of any kind of treaty uh, rights whatsoever, having, except their right to annex Scotland far beyond the limits and in violation of the conditions. That is familiar to every single one of these countries. We can prove it. We can do the list. Here you go. Here are the dates. Here's what the treaty says. Here's what the claim of rights says. Here's the conditions. Here's what proves that we knew that was that was a constitutional condition. It was expected it would apply in Scotland. Here's, here's what they've done. Here's the fact that the UK doesn't really exist. It's just England strutting around, excuse my language, but bollock naked under the Union Jack. There's nobody, nothing else under there. And there's your proof. Argue with that. Here's what has happened to Scotland. How many people did you use? Right. Well, we don't know how many were killed um, uh, by by the uh, post Culloden, whether they had anything to do with it or not. But it was a hell of a number. We don't know how many were killed by the clearances. We don't know how many driven off by troops to die on the coasts of Scotland. We don't know how many died. We don't know how many. We think about 100,000 sold into slavery. But we do know we lost four, around 4.2 million people to forced, bought, or, or um, un- uh, enforced by, star- uh, uh, by starvation, emigration. We do know that we lost about 4.2 million people. How many people have we got in Scotland today? 
but we lost 4.2 million people. We had, at the time of the union, it is, it is estimated we had 40% of the, um, of the population of England. Um, you know, and that was after Cromwell. And believe me, that was not a, 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 a small uh, decimation that happened to Scotland. That was after Cromwell. We still had 40%. Um, today, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 4.2 million Scots and they were bought their passage uh, forced into that passage deported or forced by starvation into into leaving I I have photographs, I have a collection of photographs um, from all the the ports of Scotland particularly the the ones on the islands, the Metagama It's, it's horrific it's horrific off they're going Hundreds of thousands of people, boatload after boatload, going to Australia and Canada and New Zealand and, and America. No, that's not a, that's not a hard no, uh, thing sorry, to convince no, the international. Sorry, uh, I'm not so sure whether I should go down this road as an Englishman, um, but uh, it will be at one with the Scottish heritage. Um, but I've struggled over the last five or six years to familiarise myself with the Scots language. And one of the things that, um, as it, it, that I've learned in that process is um, what appears to me to be a, an example of the kind of annexation you're talking about that a lot of Scottish people have experienced having their language beaten out of them. Yeah. I mean, I'd be interested to know how many people in the room have had that experience. Yeah. And my grandmother, and my, my grandmother's great regret, um, and she was born in 1902, and her great regret was that her parents would not allow her to learn Gaelic. She could understand it, hear it spoken, but she wasn't allowed to speak it because of the, the repercussions. That came all the way from the cutting people's tongues out after... Uh, uh, after uh, the, 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 the independent Jacobite independence war, so it, it's that's what that's what they do, and they make you ashamed of your language. And you know, I still remember going when I arrived in Stirling University. I had learnt; I'd been sent to, to boarding school, and I I had learnt to speak BBC English. You know, I I got over that fairly quick. But uh, you know that was what you did. Um, you know, if you were going into TV, if you were going into, you know, the the, the echelons of uh, administrative the administrative classes, that's what you did. You got a BBC accent. A revolting thing. I I think most of us in here, all of us in here, would love to accept everything you say. I certainly do. Uh, my problem is almost the last thing you said. I, I don't believe that England or the UK, if you like, would be quaking in their boots at any of this. They've got an almost unparalleled track record. Of you know, UN resolution. I, I, I never Chagos asked. Chagos Islands. I, no, well, the Chagos Islands they have handed over, or will go to another colonising power, but they finally had to hand it over to Mauritius. Um, and our situation, you know, we've talked to various lawyers about this, um, international lawyers. Scotland's position is, is, is completely different from the Chagos Islands. Secondly, we're not talking about going to the UN asking for independence. Yeah. We've got absolutely no intention of doing that. What we do need to do is we do have to have Scotland's position clarified in international law. Now, are they quaking in their boots? I refer you to Lord Offord, Alistair Jack. Um, there are at least three or four others who have recently made incredibly threatening statements. They have also written to the embassies of foreign nations, producing very, very sharp rebukes from France and Germany to say, we, um, you may not speak to Scottish representatives without an English embassy uh, representative present. That's fear. They don't, they've never done that before, ever. I can't match you in terms of name dropping, but I did speak a few months ago to somebody who, is, who claims anyway to be an expert on UK constitutional law. And his attitude was just to back it off. He actually said, remember, Barry from Tweed is still at war with Russia. They would just see it as some historical anachronism. Like, no, they wouldn't. Their argument is no, no. Argument what you just said, what you should say is they might yeah. see it as some historical anachronism. That's your argument. Not they would, they might. Okay. 
My answer to that is we already know that they don't. We already know that. There are, there are absolute requirements, and we have dug up the UN, the international law, to which the UK is a signatory. And what they do here... By the way, do you know how many, do you know how many law faculties teach Scottish constitutional law along with... English constitutional law, or UK constitutional law. It's about zero. I did say it was an English constitution. Yeah. They, how can you comment on something of which you are utterly and totally mm. ignorant? And I will refer you to Lord Cooper. You know that famous obiter that the doctrine of English parliamentary sovereignty is an exclusively English principle with no equivalent in what Scottish constitutional law. That it exists is beyond doubt. But nobody knows what it is. Mm. Or they didn't until now. We do. Or at least we know the bones of it now. And we also know, because we sit in this little bubble I talked about, where we don't learn civics, we don't understand international law, we're not taught about the relationship between countries under international law. Who has signed up to what? Where is the UK a signatory? How does that bind it? What are the consequences of it violating it? Have you any idea? No, neither, neither did I, because they make damn sure we know nothing about it. But the consequences of violating international law, as we have now discovered, can be very, very serious. They have got by by pretending that Scotland is part of a voluntary union, an equal partner, uh, some, uh, a country that benefits, and they're obviously part of a constitutional settlement. It's a total lie, and that is going to be sweet music to the ears of a bunch of countries right now so pissed off with the UK that, that uh, they're at boiling point. My question, which may seem a bit stupid, is do you think where, had the vote gone differently with the EU, would we be in a stronger position or a weaker position? Stronger, I suspect. Had the vote gone differently in the EU? Because I, I, I get the vibe, you, you, yeah. you've alluded to this already, that uh, there's a certain deal of sympathy. You talked about France and Germany being... Uh, do I suspect that... You, we, we have a, a bit of a mountain to climb. Yeah. So everything that I talk about us doing, you know, I'm, I, and, and, you know, thank God I'm not a politician and I'm never going to be one, please. Um, so I don't have to sit here and say, we're going to do this and we will deliver, vote for us and, you know, I, you know and, and we will deliver independence and we will deliver this ruling. No, I can sit here and say, here's what it's going to take and be absolutely honest about it. Mm. What it's going to take is we need to get signatories. We need to get signatures for the Edinburgh Proclamation. We've got all the rest. Um, I'm not going to spell it out here because I see no reason to, 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 to give this so-and-so's advance warning, but we do know how to get, no matter what anyone tells you, we know exactly how to get to the International Court of Justice. We know. And people will say, nonsense, they'll have to do this, and they'll veto them, and, you know, go on. We, we, we've done that job. We know how to do this. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. We need the signatories. We need the public support. We need public awareness. There are various things we're launching that are going to help create that awareness across Scotland. We need to get out of the independence bubble. We need to get to Scots that don't think it's got anything to do with them to let them know. Um, and then we, then we start... And actually, we, you know... So we start the process of raising awareness within the international community. The fact that Scotland voted to stay in the European Union and was dragged out by those in Westminster has gained Scotland considerably more sympathy with the European community. They are going to be more likely to be, to be sympathetic and more likely to go right. They're not, this, this, these guys aren't talking about breaking up the union. They're talking about making it work the way it was supposed to. And, and, and won't it be really funny to watch England running around trying to pay its debts while Scotland's got all the oil and all the gas? That, that's, you know, we can do that in a way that won't alarm the Americans won't, won't uh, worry the European Union about another state breaking up. And um, 
decide, you know, and, and part of that is that, you know, we also have the right to direct democracy. We have the right to have a vote under both international and Scots constitutional law on anything we want, any time we like. So that gives us this, this option that I suspect the European Union, with whom the English state has again trashed the treaty agreements completely on, on the right of its own sovereignty, gives them a chance to give it a bloody nose as well. Without going as far as breaking up the state, without going as far as worrying the Americans about Trident and all the rest of it, um, and it gives us, you know, and, and if we can make that work, and we, you know, we, we don't want to be, we're, we're, Salvo and Liberation are not going to be looking to be elected to power, not, not anytime soon, not ever. We have no stake in, in terms of power and privilege and prestige post liberation of Scotland at all. We don't need people, you know, we, we're free to join, but there's no, there's no membership fee. We run on donations, we'll fundraise when we need to. We're about restoring something to Scotland that belongs to Scotland. We can't do it without the support of the Scottish people. And we don't ask people to choose between, you know, Albus, SNP, ISP or anybody else. This is, this is a wholly different approach and attitude. This is about, this is, a, this is a fraud, guys. There is no union. It's a complete fiction. And we have an international community so, excuse me, pissed off with the English state calling itself the UK right now that we'd be idiots to lose that opportunity. While all the doors close on us domestically, that one is wide open. And it's scaring them enough that they are issuing instructions, like the imperialists they are, to foreign governments not to meet with Scottish representatives to discuss Scotland's position. That's fear, and there's been a load of them. Now, the, the English establishment, particularly the English legal establishment, and the Scottish, um, completely uneducated in the Scottish constitution, the Scottish establishment, We'll, we'll go, oh, 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 because they still think, they still think that their exceptionalism, that their empire is in place. They still think that they're safe, that it can't happen to them. Well, we're going to show otherwise. But, you know, again, we're going to need, we're going to need Scotland to rise up behind us. It's completely, it's a, what we're talking about is revolutionary, but peaceful. I'm going to say something there, it's Selma's turn. I've got so many questions in hand. <laughs> um, firstly, have you got any feelers out to other nations at the moment? You know, uh, Norway, Iceland, the ones that we would automatically think of first? We've got, um, we've done some preliminary work with, um, but beginning with organisations that are involved and committed to um, participatory and direct democracy. Um, beginning to look at, because there's a case to, to put together, beginning to look at Scotland's situation. So then what, we, what you would do is um, you, 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 may, you, you have meetings, you arrange for briefings. Um, the next thing that we'll have to do is, there are people that make that possible. The, the, the UN is an absolute labyrinth. I don't know if you've ever tried to find a document that has been archived by the UN. Good luck with that. It's, uh, you know, needle in a haystack doesn't come close to it. There are committees and groups and subgroups and this person isn't the right one and that person, you don't want to let them know. what. You, it's an absolute minefield. So what you do is you have your ducks lined up first and you begin making approaches and you begin putting things in place. And if you're wise, you'll have a guide to the labyrinth um, that costs a wee bit of money. By the time we get to the international court, and once they realise, once the British state... Can I tell you a wee story? I was going to say once the British state realises. Can I tell you a wee story? Um, a friend of mine, Craig Dempsey, who's also a Salvo member, works for Neil Hanby. And he went down to Westminster for the McCorkendale um, press conference. You know, when... when uh, you will have noticed we noticed that uh, a great deal was made out of this convention and it was kind of, and, and the international route, because we got a lot of flack for saying the international route was important, the ICJ was important, and that we wanted to do this. 
we were pilloried, we were rubbished, um, you know, particularly, I'm afraid, by um, fairly senior people in the Alba party. And then they got this briefing back from a Corkadale and, you know, ICJ route. So, so it's the convention. Yeah, um, you will notice the ICJ route, guys, right? Anyway, um, that's my little snide aside because I'm, I'm annoyed about that. Mm-hmm. But you know what? It, 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 we have it, it's not annoyed enough to not have bridges with everybody. Um, but what then happened was that he told me he went. Craig told me he he'd gone for it was baking hot in London, and he'd gone into this local pub, local watering hole where the Westminster MPs tend to go and hang out with their, you know, their staff and researchers and all the rest of it. And he said he noticed four chaps standing there. Um, you know, Tory MPs and or their, you know, their uh, researchers or, or whatever. And they, he was standing and getting his pint when, uh, or whatever he was getting, when they, he heard them begin to talk about this McCorkadale um, opinion. And one of them said, so, so what does this mean? What does, what, what, what's this, what's this all, uh, all, all mean for us? What's all about that? Anyway, the, this other guy began explaining what this opinion actually meant. And Craig said, he was, he was absolute, it was rubbish. He had no idea. He was talking absolute nonsense. And the others were all nodding along. And then, so, 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 so we have nothing to worry about. That, you know, that, that, that's fine. And then one of them said, yes, but, but uh, this is going to help Salvo, isn't it? <laughs> Interesting. So, don't think they don't know. Don't think they're not worried. This is the first occasion I've actually had to hear uh, what you have to say, and it's absolutely intriguing and inspiring. If I heard you correctly, however, you said towards the beginning that there was a requirement to register as a liberation movement. The, it's a, so that's... It's a relatively... About, yeah. a bit about that, please. That's a and relative... The yeah, sure. The question that I have is... What are the actual next steps okay. to move this forward? Right. A liberation movement. Um, I, I have to credit Alf Baird, Professor Baird, um, for, for uncovering this and making it public. Again, so much of what we have been finding out has been there all along. It's just, it's sitting under all this narrative, all the things that people think they know because they've been... They've been told this, just like you know, the claim of right is a sectarian piece of nonsense, when it's absolutely a condition of the union and it's a constitutional document. In the same way, these things, we're, we're, we're not familiar with the processes of international law. Other countries are much more than we are. You know, there's all kinds of organisations that work in and through the United Nations. The last time we, Scotland had anything like that was the Scotland UN Committee. And my gosh, did they do a power of good for Scotland. You can, you can thank them for, for devolution, really, um, which may or may not have been a good thing in the long run, but that we got it because of them. But we don't know. So Alf Baird found out that what we think of, you know, the liberation movement of these guerrillas with machine guns, and that's a liberation movement. You know, it's the... But actually, that's not what... It, you know, a liberation movement expresses the desire of a people for independence from a foreign power. Scotland can demonstrate like that, that we have absolutely no, we are not autonomous, we have absolutely no say in our own affairs, um, that, that, that we are subject to a foreign power. Liberation movement, it, 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 it's really not that simple, to, difficult to register. Now, the steps are, you need to show a degree of public support. That includes all the public support for, for independence in Scotland. So all those rallies, all those votes, the, 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 the turnout at the referendum, that shows a significant percentage of the population. When we break that down at the referendum, we show that the, the actual residents, the indigenous population of Scotland, voted 53% in favour of independence. We have a liberation movement. Now, you want to give a showing you know, to show that, that you are broadly known about and, and uh, supported. So we were advised, we, you know, there's no number. It's really annoying. They don't give you a number to say you must have this many people signed up. Um, 
so we got international advice and you know went to to uh, people that uh, professors of uh, international law and so on we said look that have a lot to do with you and we said all right t- t- tell us about this what do we need how many how many people and and uh, Paul McCartney at unforgettable of the unforgettable name came back and said well um, and he said this at the SSRG conference last year because we, we asked it publicly we've been asking around he said well look he said I, I you know pretty good rule of thumb if you have the same number of signatories as members of the largest political party that is the one that gets voted in then you represent the same constituency as that political party so we said at the time the SNP was claiming they had 100,000 members um, now it's 72 I think so oh I don't you know that's 30,000 less that we have to uh, that, that we have to get, but it's a it's a symbolic thing. So we started collecting signatures. We got a website up. We put you know, we made it very easy for people to sign the proclamation. We put a lot of security in place, and we found out that people were not uh, suddenly the, the the signatures stopped, absolutely stopped. So what we've now discovered is that somebody we know exactly who bought three hundred and thirty eight or sites that. Look, when you type it in, they're almost exactly the same as liberation.scot. Some tiny little variation, a capital or a this or a that, or the other or a hyphen. And what we did was we, we got, we finally, got, and people were having hell's t- trouble trying to, to sign up. You know, and they gave up in the end. And that's what was supposed to happen. And so what happened was that, so, so we, we followed this one guy, he signed up, got onto the site, clicked the button, it's being checked at the other side as he does it nothing happened. It was a mirror site. They cloned our site. It's got nothing behind it. It looks like the button has been pressed, but you won't get an email back registering you. Um, so then we, that's when we knew. Then we found out the legislation under which they did it, which is such that they're only supposed to monitor what you're doing, but they're, they intercept to do it via the domain name server. And once they've intercepted, they can do what the heck they like. Nobody knows what they're doing. Nobody can look over their shoulder. Nobody can say, but you're putting up mirror site because who knows? It's being done by the British state to protect their financial and, and, and security interests because they can. And so then we did, we had a rally. We went, we had people at the rally in Glasgow and we had uh, a, a bunch of them signing up people with, with uh, phones or, or tablets that had VPNs on them. Um, that's you know virtual privacy networks, so you're rooted outside the British establishment. And we got, I got someone who'd gone round getting from from someone who, how many did you sign up? How many did you? And he came back and he said, okay, so we got uh, 400 and I think it was 464 signups. Um, one guy had you know came back and he'd had 26. When we went and checked with the the data, the website administrator, the database, we'd got 44 of those. So we were we'd been losing we'd been losing ninety percent. It's not as bad as that now. We publicised it everywhere. We told people all about it, and we told them to use VPNs, and we're going to do paper signups. And suddenly, the um, you know we're getting a a, a a slow but steady flow. Most of the damage was done. You know, we we should have been able to go and say months ago we've got thirty thousand. All we need is another. Is because people were frustrated. They tried and failed over and over. We didn't seem to be moving. They went, ah, oh, and that was the whole point of the exercise. Mm-hmm. However, they reckoned without us, and uh, we'll start all over again, and we'll do it any way we can, and we will get those numbers. And we're already getting ready to, um, to, to take that campaign international. I think that actually shows that the British state is, in actual fact, very worried, <laughs> because they know they, that we are on our... Yeah. Salva is on extremely solid ground. They're certainly not worried about our politicians. They can wind them round their little fingers, but they are anxious about Salva. Yeah. But they want an anxious eh? Well, you know, if you go to all that trouble, yeah. you sabotage a website, and you, you know, and you're and you're talking about, you know, you're talking about Alba has this, um, you know, and, and and let me just say, I can be, I am peed off, ticked off with the people that did harm by publicly criticising the idea of going to the international court mm. and poo-pooing it at a time when we were trying to gain publicity. And that was not the ALBA party, and there were people in the SNP that did the same thing. It was certain people who did that. 
and I am still ticked off with them. But that has nothing to do with, you know, that has nothing to do with being um, for or against any party. I'm absolutely for every politician who genuinely wants to see Scotland free and and uh, to get our rights back. So I just want to make that really clear. Um, I probably shouldn't complain, but 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 that it really that that did harm not as much as the state doing that to our website, but it did harm, and we need them to stop it. And you know, they do the political thing; we'll do this. We can support each other. That's how that should be. Um, so, the last thing is then once you have that in place, you now have access. You now can start having these meetings and and. Um, creating these relationships and setting, putting briefings together and, you know, um, so we have a bit, we have a bit to go, but it's not, you know, it's, it's much clearer that, that, that route is, it's a much clearer process than anything that we can see in terms of, you know, a referendum or a plebiscite where you can't get, you can't get the flipping parties to say, all right, let's, let's sit down together. Our speaker was Joanna Cherry. And quite a few of the people here were also at that meeting. And she was asked about Salvo, and she said she had met you, and you had talked to her, and she did not think that this was a viable option. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe speak to us about that, please? That is a, you know, that is a point of disagreement that I will say again, you know, she's a very smart lady. Mm -hmm. I admire her very much. And she has never studied Scots constitutional law. And we've discussed that. There is no faculty that teaches it. And she was one of those people who said, oh, the claim of right is, you know, it's, how would you bring it back? It's gone into dissuadude. Now she knows different, because we've proved different. The claim of right is not in dissuadude. The claim of right is very much in force. And at this moment, although it would be very difficult to force the English state court to acknowledge its its force because it's a, you know it's a rogue state, as Craig Murray says. It's not there's nothing legal about it. Nonetheless, an individual could still, in theory, bring a case for their civil or or, or uh, liberties and rights under the claim of right in the, in the court of session, and it would have to be heard. So she did not. When I talked to her about, it, she didn't know that. She completely did, absolutely, neither did Roddy Dunlop. They had to run off and talk to Douglas Cullen, who said, yes, it is in force. It's one of the reasons why the Supreme Court's you know, legality is dubious, is, you know, suspect. Thank you. But, you know, she's also not an international lawyer. You know, and we've had into people who have some international experience, again, brainwashed through the English legal system with no Scots constitutional law included, telling us, you'd have to go through the General Assembly. There is no committee, there's not, no, nobody who could, would be, who is authorised, who would match, to, to ask for an advisory ruling from the ICJ that matches your um, manifesto, your, mm. what you're looking for. Over and over again, we get, we look into it and it's no wrong Ask her the next time, what is the constitutional settlement implied in the treaty, the constitutional settlement of the United Kingdom? What is it? She won't be able to tell you. It's not her expertise, but she will speak as she has been taught to, to, to think. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that is. Everything else, you know, when it comes to domestic law, when it comes to, to uh, political will and integrity and sheer guts I think she's amazing yeah. and she's just bloody wrong on the claim of right <laughs> Thank you Sarah, um, I think it's quite important to inform the English people about Stockholm I think it's very important what you're doing at the level international, European but there are a lot of English people who would be very interested in knowing what you just told us today. Down, down in England, I mean, I'm English, you know what I mean? Yes. But I think it's important for our nearest neighbors, a lot of them, I think, would like to know what's happening here. And they're not gonna get it down there because, let's face it, it's an important time, I believe, 
for us now to look to Europe internationally as you say because the Westminster government just all over the place yes. and the people down there are so, excuse my French, pissed off, mm. a lot of them with it, that it's a good time for people down there on the street level, the grassroots, to get to know about this. So if anybody's going down to England... You but you know, there is a, a very interesting movement happening in England. Um, sadly, that... that um, I'm not going to use a descriptive word at all. Neil Oliver is associated. <laughs> <laughs> he has associated himself with it, but it's a con- it's an English constitutional movement mm-hmm. based on the notion that this parliamentary sovereignty that uh, over the people is, is actually unlawful in England too, which is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, I sent them to, to kind of went, well, all right, Neil Oliver or not, here you go. Sent them some stuff that they you know that I, but but didn't get a reply. Um, to show them that actually the parliamentary sovereignty that they're opposing um, was passed by a, 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 a convention that was, un- not a parliament, a convention that was improperly called and it was, that provision was only put in there because they couldn't think of any way around the fact that James had left, he'd fled and you, they, they had, we had a way of calling a legitimate uh, alternative to a parliament capable of, of, of statutory um, you know, making statutory legislation. They didn't in England. They only had conventions with the status as the Sewell Convention has. Again, that's, by the way, a con- that's a convention under English law, not Scots, and yet again, that's being applied in Scotland. However, the Bill of Rights, which, which gave the Parliament this horrific, tyrannical sovereignty, um, was, was not passed by a legitimate Parliament, nor by a legitimate convention, even with its limited sp- powers, and the, that sovereignty that was being asserted, which all kinds of total rubbish is written about, this was an English principle. Oh, I'll tell that to Henry VIII and Elizabeth I and the rest of them, and, and James and Charles and whatever. That, that's the first they've heard of it. It was put in there because they couldn't have a legit, call a legitimate parliament uh, with the king, because it needed the king there. And so by transferring the sovereignty to the parliament, they could, de- they could basically declare that James had abdicated and so on. And so it, it, it was a, a mere device, and yet it stayed in place. And you know, people in England have been denied any kind of real democracy, any accountability by, by this absolute parliament, this, the total monarch. You know, basically all the MPs in Westminster are wearing invisible crowns <laughs> be, be, because of that. And so, you know, I think it's very interesting that that movement is happening in England as well. And, and I, you know, if, if Oliver and his lot would care to respect the Scottish constitutional position, I think, you know, we could, we could help them with theirs. Yeah. But just let them know, you know, because yeah. I know quite a few friends of mine have said, you know, because I've spoken to them about you as soon as you came into being. I mean, I didn't really understand a lot of it because it's so... <laughs> quite a lot to take on. No kidding. But it's just very, very interesting. And the fact is, I mean, my, my husband's a Scot, yeah. and he said to me, Errol, you know, that union, the people actually were on the street, yes. telling the people, not the... Well, there's a very interesting, a very interesting fact that um, a, a, one of our young members um, found this declaration from Perth that was pinned up at the Perth Market Cross. Um, uh, uh, pro- prophesying actually what would happen under the Union, all of, all of it correct. I just found out the other day, um, two nights ago in fact, that declaration was produced by Scotland's third parliament. Here's the thing you may or may not have known. So, you know, Scotland had three parliaments. The reason these old documents talk about our parliaments, have you noticed? If you've ever read objections or things written about what's going to happen to Scotland, our parliaments, plural. You had the, the what we understand as a parliament, which is what Westminster has, the king and, or queen and, and parliament. You had the convention of the estates, which had to be consulted on any taxes that were raised, which um, negotiated anything internationally. And, and when you go into it, and, and I'll tell you, there's not a historian out there that knows this. Not one. It's, it's, it's Just as our politicians, our, our lawyers, know nothing about the Scottish constitution, our Scottish historians know sweet, Mm-hmm. About, mm-hmm. Ab- about the real political settlement in Scotland. Yeah. The Convention of the Estates had come through from the Guardians of the Realm, became the General or Greater Council of Scotland. Its name changed to uh, 
Convention of the States, which just means an, a, the assembly of the communities of Scotland. And it had enormous power. Um, you know, masses of our records have disappeared. But, you, you know, it's sort of like you're, you have a prism on things. And the prism has been that put there by an English his, historical um, slant for so long that you kind of see what's right in front of you. So the Convention of the Estates was a parliament. It was the Estates. They, they could pass legislation in the absence of a, of a parliament. Um, when a new king or queen had to be um, inaugurated in Scotland, there couldn't be a parliament because there wasn't a monarch. It was always the Convention of States that did that, that, that um, you brought in the next monarch and got them to swear the oaths and pass the legislation for that. Um, and then the third parliament was the, um, it, it has various names, but it's often known as the Convention of the Royal Boroughs. And that would get oversight of proposed parliament, parliamentary legislation in Scotland. It would, it would work with the Convention of the Estates and, and the subcommittees of the Parliament of Scotland, par, uh, the, you know, the three estates. Um, and it was enormously influential. It, it, it drafted um, a good bit of legislation for Scotland. Um, the Borough Act, Common Good Act, uh, the one that put in officers to make sure that the, 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 the common good um, provision in Scotland meant that every time a tax was raised, um, a percentage of what was raised went back to the borough, um, as well as them keeping their common good assets and the income from that, and that couldn't be taxed. A percentage of every tax went back to the boroughs. You know, hundreds of these boroughs. And that's so, you know, thus you have the schools and the hospitals and all, all the things that we had and working class lads learning, you know, Greek and Latin and Hebrew and astro astronomy and philosophy and theology and, you know, working class lads in, in, in free compulsory grammar schools. So they passed it up, but what they found was that the layers, the, as time went on, they weren't, they were doing the counting and so they, they knew they weren't getting back what they should. So they got an act passed which meant, in, by the Parliament, they put it forward, drafted it, and it was passed that every time a tax was collected, there had to be an independent auditor so that the boroughs got their money back. So that was quite important legislation yeah. that they would put forward. This objection to the union wasn't produced by one place. It was produced by the Convention of the Royal Boroughs. That was a Parliament. That's really important. So, you know, these are things... I'm. I, the last two years, I've learned things about Scottish history I would never have dreamt of. Mm -hmm. Never have dreamt. That's nice. Yeah, I'm totally supportive of what you're doing there in terms of using the international awareness. But I think it's sort of a direct, the, the, the biggest difference uh, potentially could be made is making the people of Scotland aware of this sort of thing. I mean, I know that's not a simple matter that we think are set up. But, you know, one thing I would suggest, and it may seem another absolute thing, angle to take, but, you know, what you're saying here sounds good, but I know that there's some people who call themselves legal authorities and such like the dispute <coughs> what I'd love to see, would maybe be something like a university, uh, you could start that idea conference, where yourself could, other people could put forward your point of view, the uh, people that call themselves legal authorities that oppose it, Speak against that. There should be in the colloquium uh, people start to argue that reason is like at an academic level, yep, to try and we're also doing a test for analysis of, of the, the, the claim of right because other people have kept it differently. We've, uh, we've, we've run the claim but of right. That's a good place to start. Well, the, we, we don't think we're, we don't think we're starting. A, a year ago, Roddy Dunlop was calling us. Uh, moon howlers, and talking about exactly as Joanna Cherry did, how the claim of right was in disuetude and how would you bring it back, and it's a 300-year-old law. Within three months of the debate going back and forward and my referring him to um, Lord Cullen, he came back, and I have it on my phone, um, a discussion about uh, the uh, 2018 debate in Westminster on the claim of right. You remember that put forward by Ian Blackford. This House. Yeah. This House passed unopposed. Passed unopposed because they couldn't oppose it without, under, without destroying the Union. 
we might have not know, known that. Our lawyers, our politicians, including Joanna, might not have known that. But think about this logically. How many bills put forward in Westminster by the SNP have passed? Do you know? Two. Two. One on fox hunting and the claim of right. Had there been more people present, that would have become acknowledged as binding in law. So what they did was they stayed away. Now, ask you, really, they turn up to boo and jeer and heckle and vote down every single bill that has ever been put forward in Westminster by the, the SNP, but they let that pass unopposed? Come on. Really? Why? That's the point. That is the point. The claim of right is established. Roddy Dunlop's on there referring to that debate, and someone says, you know, what about the claim of right? And someone else comes in and says, um, but it didn't make it law. And the other person says, aye, but it, um, it, it, it established it and it referred to it. And Roddy Dunlop finally comes in three months later and, he, and I've got it there and says, to be honest, to be fair, it didn't require that ba- debate to establish that the claim of right is still law. This is not a matter of opinion. This is a fact. And, I'm, you know, we will debate. I've been asked to do something that the, Lloyd Quinnan would like me to debate at the Faculty of Advocates. The, you know, um, think, think about that for a minute, how, how, how much you would enjoy doing that yourself. So I've not been exactly jumping at that idea. But I will. It's like the thing about the BBC. Apologies. Sure. I have to be somewhere. It's like the thing about the BBC. You know, the, B, the, the impartiality. Uh, you know, the impartiality. The BBC. One person says that it's raining outside, and the other person says that the sun is shining. Let's be impartial and let's have them both together. Really? <laughs> Stick your head at the window. There are facts. We don't, we, don't, we don't need to argue. We can prove them. There they are. Established fact. It is a fact that if there is a union, there is a constitutional well, settlement. Fact, that's a it doesn't matter. Because, it, it, look, it, you can accept it's raining or not raining. If I can sh- push your hand out the window and it'll get wet, it's raining. <laughs> there is no doubt anywhere in the world that in order for a United Kingdom to exist, there is a constitutional settlement. That's just... That is a fact. You have, it. you have two choices. Which is it? Was Scotland annexed or is there a constitutional settlement? Now, right now, what the UK government is saying and people like Neil King and all these other people is, aye, but Scotland was voluntarily annexed. Sadly, and that's been, yes, yes, that's what they agreed to. Yes, they knew that's what they agreed to. Well, I have news for them. Here's the international law, A, B, C, D. There is no such thing in international law as a voluntary colony. So have it which way? We're a, we're a colony, voluntary or otherwise, or we have a constitutional settlement. Now, I'm very happy for somebody to tell me the answer to that in a way that doesn't require them to put back the rights and privileges that were determined for Scotland at the time of the Union. But so far, nobody's been able to. And the wee legal troll Neil King goes around coming straight back to the same question. Article 1 of the treaty says that there's to be one kingdom. And that's what it says, and so that's what it is. Oh, I see. So the treaty is self-authorising, is it? What's that? Self-authorising, which we've come to accept because we're all colonised and we've all been gaslighted and it's very, very frustrating, is the idea that what the treaty says is the law because the treaty says it. Anybody know what the problem is with that? Anyone? Well, I mean, was it ratified? Who ratified it when? But why do you need it? Why do you need it ratified? You're right. A treaty, a treaty is authorised by those negotiating it and those ratifying it. It does not authorise itself. That means... Oh, God, I wish we had some constitutional lawyers. That means... 
And I, you know, I've had to learn all of this. And and then I have to tell you know these people who are you know, earn eight thousand pounds a flipping day. What they should know already. No treaty authorizes itself. None ever. You have to have. You have to have authority. You have to own a house to sell a house. You have to have. If you get married, you can't already be married. You must be free and be an adult and have that personal authority to enter into a marriage. The, there is an authorizing, and then you're not married until you do this thing where the state authorizes you as married. Every single contract has to be authorized, has an authorizing power behind it. Who's behind the treaty? The Queen and the two parliaments of England and Scotland. That's the authorizing power. That's the authority. The treaty doesn't authorise itself. The limits and competence of those who create that treaty give it its legitimacy and its scope in exactly the same way as it would in a marriage or a house sale or a business contract. That simple law. It's not opinion. It's not my view. It's the rain is wet and the sun is hot and dry. On that basis... I have yet to come up with this, to come across a single lawyer, a single one who can say anything but, well, I don't agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the problem was you need a platform to put these arguments forward, and obviously you need somebody opposing them. It's. It's a very uh, yeah. At, at so, actually, you know, the truth is, I agree. We, but there's lots of things, you know, we need to do to get this out. And I'm not going to persuade the people in, in Scotland that they have these rights. I'm going to tell them the rights they have. They have them, and nobody, nobody should be arguing about inalienable rights. But where I'll have that argument, I'll have it in the International Court of Justice. That's where we'll have that forum. We hope you enjoyed that talk and discussion. I think there's no doubt that Salvo deserves our thanks for the amount of effort and time and sheer determined doggedness they've put into the research to get them to the position they're in now. Not everyone will agree to Salvo's stance on it, but there is no doubt that Scotland is in a constitutional conundrum and we need to find a way out of that. We need clarity on that as soon as possible. Scottish Independence Podcast will be following up on this theme over the coming months. If you're interested in listening to other discussions of Scotland's constitutional position, go to our website, that's at uh, scottishindipod.scot, and look at our category playlist, it's called A Constitution for Scotland. <laughs>